Okay, uh, thank you, Carmen, very much for your introduction. Um, today, I would like to give you an, um, yeah, an, a bit overview uh, about our work uh, at the University of Jena in, in our institute on polysaccharide-based uh, nanoparticles. Um, just, I would like to briefly introduce our institute um, because it's sort of uh, important to understand from the, the, the angle that we are using uh, to uh, obtain our materials. So uh, I'm coming from the University of Jena in Germany, uh, more specifically from the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Macromolecular Chemistry. So we are a chemistry uh, oriented institute. Um, we have classical organic uh, chemistry, so different branches uh, that you would expect here, like synthesis of dyes and drug molecules and natural products. Um, and we also uh, have a lot of colleagues uh, and, and strong uh, research in the areas of macromolecular chemistry. Um, there is a lot of uh, synthetic polymers involved here. So most of the researchers working in that uh, part of the institute are working with uh, non-natural polymers. Um, there's also a lot of um, yeah, design of novel polymer-based materials. And, um, and this is the part where I'm working on. We are also working um, on biopolymers, in particular um, polysaccharides. So the group in which I'm working as a senior researcher um, is working in the field of polysaccharide research. And our main focus is on chemical modification of polysaccharides. So what we usually do is we take the native polymers, the native uh, polysaccharides, and chemically modify them uh, in order to introduce new functionalities. So we work a lot of uh, a lot on uh, new synthesis methods um, that allow us to tailor um, the, the properties and introduce new functionalities. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of structural characterization of these materials. However, um, we usually try not to focus only on the uh, chemical part, only on the synthesis, but we also always uh, have some sort of applications in mind um, for the new uh, chemically modified polysaccharide derivatives. So we try to develop new polysaccharide-based biomaterials, um, first of all, the materials, and then, of course, we want to see them in specific applications. Um, so our research is focused on different kinds of um, polysaccharide-based materials, um, the, let's say, more traditional ones like fibers or foils. Um, we also work on um, different uh, methods for surface coating using polysaccharide derivatives. Um, we work a bit on um, polysaccharide hot melts, so basically um, glue-like compounds that you can, can use um, as, as uh, sticky adhesives, uh, adhesives to um, yeah, glue, for instance, wood together or other um, materials. Um, one part that I'm uh, very active in is uh, developing polysaccharide-based hydrogels and aerogels. Um, and of course, and this brings us to the topic of today, we are also working on polysaccharide-based um, nanomaterials. Um, so I would like to briefly start, um, uh, tell a bit more about uh, nanoparticles in, in general. Um, and me personally, I, I would like to, to use a more phenomenological um, yeah, approach to define these uh, materials, um, by which I mean um, not specifically focusing too much on the size, but more on the, um, yeah, the, the properties of these materials. So nanomaterials you can um, yeah, define as materials that have um, at least one dimension in the nanometer scale, meaning in the range of one to thousand nanometers. And what makes them special is that they show unique physical, chemical, and or biological properties that you do not find in the individual molecule on one hand or in the macroscopic bulk material on the other hand. So simply by changing the size, um, you gain um, specific unique properties here. And of course, there's a large uh, or a vast variety of different inorganic and organic uh, compounds that you can use to um, make nanomaterials. Um, 
there's uh, a lot of different inorganic um, nanomaterials usually um, referred to as more hard nanomaterials or nanoparticles, which means that they have a um, you know, rather well-defined um, surface um, that separates the, the particle from the surrounding medium. Um, on the other side, you have a lot of different um, organic nanomaterials, meaning coming from organic um, molecules, mostly organic polymers. Um, and these are often referred to as soft nanomaterials because the, the border between the particle and the surrounding medium is less defined because you don't have a, or you have a gradual uh, change in the properties uh, rather than a very um, defined change. And usually, uh, as it is depicted a bit here in the scheme, we have sort of like small polymer chains uh, coming out from the, the, um, the particle reaching into the surrounding medium. So it's a bit more difficult to say where the, the particle ends and the surrounding medium begins. And then you can further distinguish these organic uh, polymer nanomaterials. Uh, uh, for instance, you can uh, distinguish synthetic polymers on one hand. Uh, here again, you can also uh, even distinguish more between hydrophilic and hydrophobic and you know, also everything in between. And on the other hand, we have uh, natural polymers, so natural biopolymers like uh, DNA, uh, proteins, but also polysaccharides. And then you have something like a gray area in between um, where you uh, speak about chemically modified biopolymers. So it's strict, not strictly a, a natural polymer, but also not really a synthetic polymer. Um, so we are uh, in between somehow. And this is the area in which I'm working, in which our group is working um, using polysaccharide derivatives. So when you do a short literature research and try to find something about polysaccharide nanoparticles or nanomaterials, um, it's really very challenging because there are different classes of polysaccharide-based nanoparticles that, that you will find. Um, in the first talk, we, we already heard about um, this exciting uh, field here, the nanocellulosis, um, where we have, uh, for instance, the, the cellulose nanocrystals and uh, nanofibrillated celluloses. Um, so these are nanomaterials that are prepared by a top-down approach. Um, and of course, also the bacterial celluloses that are uh, more or less native um, polysaccharide-based nanostructures. Another approach, um, we also use this in our group um, uh, to some extent, is that you can uh, take a natural or a, a already existing nanomaterial, for instance, inorganic uh, iron oxide uh, nanoparticles, and you can coat them with a layer of a polysaccharide, which uh, more or less makes this a, a nano composite of a nano um, uh, material with an, uh, a coating or an outer layer of a polysaccharide. And then there's different um, yeah, uh, bottom-up approaches, meaning that you start from the individual polymers and, and assemble them into um, nanomaterials. Um, for instance, there's a lot of work using uh, chitosan or also alginate, and then using different chemical or electrostatic uh, cross-linking mechanisms. Uh, that you can tune in such a way that instead of a macroscopic precipitate, you end up with uh, nanomaterials. You can, as I said, you can do that uh, by electrostatic cross-linking, for instance, mixing two uh, differently or oppositely charged uh, polyions, but you can also cross-link um, using uh, smaller, um, like in, uh, smaller ions um, to obtain these nanomaterials. You can also modify polysaccharides um, with specific uh, groups that enable, um, so to speak, supramolecular uh, self-assembling or supramolecular cross-linking. Um, for instance, you can modify um, polysaccharide polymer chains with these uh, cyclodextrin uh, substituents that um, enable sort of like a host-guest interaction with specific uh, moieties 
And you can use that supramolecular uh, self-assembling also to prepare uh, polysaccharide-based nanomaterials. And the uh, topic I would like to focus on today uh, uses uh, also self-assembling, but here we use uh, hydrophobic polysaccharide derivatives um, that self-assemble by themselves into spherical nanoparticles. The process um, why, uh, that you can use here is, is rather simple. It's called nanoprecipitation. Um, so you start not with a native poly, uh, polysaccharide, but with a hydrophobically modified polysaccharide derivative. Um, and this derivative uh, or the characteristics are that it should be soluble in an organic solvent. And it has to be insoluble uh, in, in another solvent, usually uh, this is or insoluble in a non-solvent which is usually um, water. And if you tune the uh, transition from the dissolved state to the non-dissolved state um, in, a, in a very gradual and controlled way, as it is represented here in this phase diagram, um, when you shift here from the dissolved state along this uh, red um, yeah, line here, um, gradually into this metastable region, reaching this, um, yeah, very uh, small area here called Ouzo region. Um, what then can happen is that these uh, polysaccharide um, polymers can assemble into such uh, spherical uh, nanoparticles. And this nanoprecipitation, you can use different um, processes to induce this um, precipitation. Um, a very easy approach is uh, depicted here. It's a simple dialysis approach. So you start with the poly, uh, saccharide solution in an organic solvent, for instance, uh, dimethyl acetamide. Um, and you place this into a dialyzing bag and you have a, so that you have a, uh, a gradual exchange. The solvent goes out and the non-solvent goes in. And in the end, um, we should actually see this video here. Um, so in the end, you will observe uh, the uh, formation. Okay, the video is not working, um, but you will see uh, um, uh, the formation of this of such a turbid nanoparticle uh, dispersion here. And you can do that with different uh, kinds of uh, polysaccharide derivatives, hydrophobically modified. Um, a very good and often used uh, example is displayed here: uh, cellulose acetate, which is uh, organosoluble, insoluble in water. And when you do this dialyzing approach uh, in a convenient way, you will end up uh, with nanoparticle uh, dispersions in water. A very important um, feature here is the polymer concentration. Um, more precisely, uh, the, the concentration that you can apply here should be below the critical overlap concentration, which is the concentration where the polymer chains uh, start to entangle in the um, polymer solution. Um, and as long as you stay below this critical overlap concentration, you can basically obtain um, these spherical nanoparticles. And once you um, increase the concentration further, you usually end up with macroscopic uh, larger precipitates. Another approach um, to uh, induce this nanoprecipitation uses dropping in approaches. Um, so you start with a polysaccharide solution um, and you slowly drop this polysaccharide solution so the, from the soft state into a non-solvent, slowly approaching this uh, solubility limit. Or you can do it vice versa, that you start with the polysaccharide solution and then you gradually add um, the non-solvent. So also in these two cases, you have a, a slow change in the solubility uh, of the polysaccharide derivative, which then finally induces this uh, self-assembling of these polymer chains. Then uh, what you need to do is you need to evaporate um, the solvent by a temperature increasing or by increasing temperature. And then you also end up with an aqueous um, dispersion of these polysaccharide nanoparticles. Of course, in this approach, you will need um, organic solvents like uh, acetone or THF that are uh, easily uh, to evaporate. Um, 
also here the concentration plays um, a certain role on the uh, particle size that you uh, can achieve and also the hydrophobicity uh, or the, the um, yeah the hydrophobicity of the derivative um, plays a role um, or determines uh, to, to a certain extent the um, size of the uh, particles that you finally obtain here. And last but not least, uh, there's a third approach that you can use to um, force the assembling of these hydrophobically modified polysaccharide derivatives into nanoparticles that uses um, a, a um, ultrasound induced uh, formation of a nano emulsion. So we start with the polysaccharide solution in a water immixable um, solvent and you form a um, emulsion with water. Um, then you remove the organic solvent, which then uh, basically forces the um, polymer chains to self-assemble into small uh, nanoparticles. This nanoemulsion technique is uh, usually yields very uniform nanoparticles, but is a bit more restrictive in terms of the solvents because you need water immixable ones. Um, on the other hand, this nanoprecipitation can yield uh, a bit broader particle sizes, but it's rather easy to perform in the end. This is just a brief overview about different derivatives and polymers that you can use. Um, so you can use different hydrophobic uh, groups, um, usually esters, to tailor to a certain degree the particle size and the shape. And you can also use different kinds of polysaccharide backbones um, in order to tune a bit the, the, for instance, the biological properties. And a very important um, part that you need to uh, remember is that you need to introduce different functional groups uh, that you require um, for specific applications. And this is actually a very important part when you uh, develop these uh, kind of nanomaterials. Um, you need certain functionalities uh, in order to fulfill different um, properties that you need for the application. So by functionalizing the polysaccharide material uh, nanoparticles, you can first of all tailor physical properties, uh, chemical properties, biological properties. Um, and also by introducing new functionalities, you gain access to a specific application. For instance, for drug delivery, of course, you need to introduce drug molecules into these um, nanomaterials, also introducing dyes or, or certain affinity groups um, yeah, can be very important. And you can use different uh, approaches that I will uh, demonstrate you today. Um, you can physically incorporate these functionalities simply by mixing um, them into the, the polysaccharide derivatives. You can chemically modify the uh, polymer backbone with these um, specific functionalities and then form the particles. Or the last approach, you can first prepare the particles and then later on introduce these functionalities. And I would like to, would like to show you some examples for all of these uh, these three different approaches. The first example is a physical entrapment, um, and it's an example um, where we tried to incorporate um, these kind of um, hydrophobic dye molecules inside of nanopart in, of these nanoparticles. Um, and we use this particular um, cellulose derivative, cellulose acetate phthalate, because it possesses uh, hydrophobic groups for the self-assembling and also um, these reactive carboxylic acid groups um, that we wanted to use to later on immobilize some uh, antibodies here. And I will show you in a minute uh, why this was important. And simply by mixing these two components, the polysaccharide derivative and one of these uh, nanoparticles, we obtained these deeply colored um, nanoparticle dispersions. Um, of course, characterized them regarding the size a bit. And we also did some um, UV vis spectroscopy um, with these particle dispersions. And the reason why we wanted to produce this um, is we wanted to use them for immunoassay applications. And this is something that nowadays everybody knows what a, an immunoassay is, um, because most of us have done it probably this this work already uh, this week already. Um, if you look uh, at these common um, 
COVID-19 tests, you will sometimes see here um, something marked like here, colloidal gold. And this is the part, um, not for uh, specifically for COVID tests, but for other immunoassay tests, where we want to um, improve these tests a little bit using uh, our polysaccharide nanoparticles. Um, and these nanoparticles, if you have a closer look on how these tests work, you will see um, that these, these labels, um, which basically in the end gives you these, this, this red line on your test, these are nanoparticles, um, gold nanoparticles uh, usually, but we wanted to replace them. Um, and on these uh, nanoparticles, you have a capture, uh, capture antibody. And depending on whether or not the antigen is present in, in the biological sample, these nanoparticles are then captured on, these, um, on, the, on the test line. Um, and the, the efficiency of the test is also determined um, basically by how bright or by how colored this, this test line is. So the, the more deeply colored the test line, the easier it is to, to detect even low concentrations. And here we want to improve um, basically the, the efficiency um, using or by developing new um, nanoparticles. And after coupling um, our nanoparticles with an antibody for C-reactive protein, um, in particular using this, this, uh, brown, uh, this um, black colored dye, you can see here uh, if you run such tests um, with our nanoparticles, what you can see here if you compare the last two lines, um, you see a deeper coloring um, with these new um, polysaccharide based nanoparticles. So you basically have a lower uh, detection limit, so a more efficient test um, in the end. Recently, we also used um, this um, encapsulation or this, this um, physical entrapment um, to entrap uh, lignin inside of different um, polysaccharide-based derivatives. Here, we wanted to in include lignin as a bioactive component in to a matrix of polysaccharide um, nanoparticles. Um, using this, this uh, nanoprecipitation approach only with lignin was not very successful. We obtained um, some particles, but those particles aggregated rather quickly. But when we incorporated them um, into the matrix or in, into the nanomatrix of polysaccharide derivatives, like it is displayed here, um, we obtained um, stable particles that that didn't aggregate. Um, we are now trying to um, investigate, uh, for instance, antioxidant properties of these composite nanoparticles. The second approach um, is to chemically modify or to introduce the uh, functionalities that you want to have in your uh, polysaccharide uh, nanoparticles by covalent bonding. This is something um, a, a PhD student in our group has done um, and he introduced this biproic acid into the backbone of cellulose and then wanted to uh, obtain nanoparticles here. And this viproic acid is very interesting um, because it's, a, it's basically a drug molecule. It's a histone deacetylase inhibitor, so it has anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And then within the frame of a large um, DG, uh, DFG funded project in our, at our university, um, he um, performed this, this synthesis of these derivative and then formed um, nanoparticles. Um, and the idea is to bring these nanoparticles into cells and then the, the this viproic acid is removed and the drug is released and you have an uh, anti-inflammatory therop uh, therapeutic ex um, um, effect inside of cells. And this is something uh, I haven't uh, told you up to now, but these um, particles that are um, prepared here, they usually show a very uh, good um, biocompatibility. So they are usually uh, non-cytotoxic. Um, most of them that have been tested so far showed a good cell viability. Um, here, he also showed that there is no uh, aggregation of blood cells. Um, so you can really introduce them um, as uh, therapeutic um, compounds. And these nanoparticles are also taken up by, by cells and you can, can follow that, um, for instance here demonstrated using live cell imaging where you can show that these um, nanoparticles are really uh, taken up by the cells and processed um, inside of these cells. 
And the last approach um, that we wanted to, uh, that I would like to show you today is um, preparing reactive nanoparticles that you can first prepare. And then after the particle preparation, you can further functionalize them. Um, and we um, prepared such particles using um, a uh, derivative that we usually use uh, in our synthesis um, approaches. Um, we recently synthesized uh, molecules like this, like a xylane phenyl carbonate. And here we introduce this phenyl carbonate group, which is an activated group um, that you can uh, convert with an amine. Um, and then you obtain a functional compound, uh, a functional uh, styling carbamate. Um, so this uh, conversion of the, the, this carbonate group with an amine to a carbamate is a, is a very efficient and, and versatile approach that you can use in a homogeneous um, synthesis. However, we discovered that these silent phenyl carbonates, they also, carbonates, they also um, form very nice uh, nanoparticles because you also have this hydrophobic group here. So you can use, for instance, dialysis to shape these uh, derivatives into nanoparticles, usually in a size range of about 150 nanometers to 100 nanometers. Um, and these, they, they show a very um, narrow particle size distribution, and they are also very stable against um, aggregation. And something that is also very important in this context is that the although we have a group that might be hydrolyzed by water. These particles are also stable against hydrolysis, at least under normal aqueous conditions. And that, that brought us to the idea, um, OK, we, we know in homogeneous solution, we can replace these uh, carbonate groups. Maybe we can also chemically modify the uh, xylene phenyl carbonate nanoparticles in aqueous um, systems. And indeed, um, that really works. So we um, use these um, nanoparticles on the surface. They should have these. Um, um, oh, I, I now realize that I uh, implemented the, the wrong picture. So you should imagine here, um, instead of these uh, activated esters, some carbonate, uh, phenyl carbonate groups on the surface. And we converted these nanoparticles directly with an uh, with a dye molecule that contained amino groups. And without any kind of uh, further pre-activation that's usually needed, um, we simply added this dye and we obtained such deeply colored um, nanoparticle dis uh, dispersions. So we were able to directly couple dye molecules onto the surface of these particles without needing any uh, complex um, chemical coupling uh, strategies. Um, the particle size is not really impaired by this um, functionalization step. So you see the, although there are different um, process steps here, the particle size basically doesn't change. Um, and these particles are also biocompatible. Um, again, um, we saw no um, change in the cell, vi cell viability, so there's no adverse effect. Um, and also we can implement or we can um, yeah, give these nanoparticles to cells and they are taken up. Um, and when you modify them with, with, nano, uh, with a dye molecule and you can um, see that for instance, uh, using fluorescent spectroscopy. And we are now thinking about uh, using this approach also to implement um, or to, to couple this with, uh, with, with um, antibodies to get some specific um, bioaffinity uh, interactions here. Okay, um, this brings me already to the end of my presentation. Uh, I would like to quickly acknowledge um, the people that did more or some of the work here, um, in particular, um, some of my coworkers, um, uh, Dr. Lars Gabriel and uh, Peter Schulze that did some work on the nanoparticles. Also some students that worked here in particular on the synthesis and the nanoparticle formation of these carbonates. Um, and of course, there's uh, a lot of collaboration work uh, involved here. Um, most, or, uh, most importantly, um, the group of Professor Thomas Heinze, in which I'm uh, working as a senior researcher. And some of the work um, that has been done here um, with this viporic acid was done by a um, yeah, doctoral student, uh, Henry Lindemann. He's working on a, a DFG funded project here on these particles. Okay. and. 
in the interest of time, I think, uh, of course, there has been uh, some funding involved here, but this is um, yeah, maybe not so super important for the science here. Um, and with this, I would like to come to the end of my talk. And first of all, thank you for your attention. And if there are some questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or if you want also later.